Secret Invasion Episode 3, where they destroy Fury. Again. Have you lost your reptilian ass mind? But this time, it's not because he's old, it's because he's always been useless. In fact, he's never done anything good in his entire life. The scrolls are responsible for all of his achievements. Every time you were promoted inside S.H.I.E.L.D., we did that. In fact, it seems the only thing that isn't secret in this show is the contempt the writers have for the main character. Another case of a man taking credit for- Scroll. Work. Scroll. But we started a scroll base. Do you think it will work? I mean, you can transform into anyone at will. If you get caught, you're an idiot. We found out in the last episode, you can transform into any superpowered person on Earth and inherit their powers. At this point, the only explanation for your unhappiness is your own incompetence. But everyone panics. I can't believe you're questioning the scrolls. How dare you suggest one of our plans wouldn't work? Look around you. Is this not the building of somebody who is successful at everything they ever do? I mean, we've got a broken door sitting on a wall. That's not a sign of success. I don't know what is. But they ask him, why did you join the resistance. Surely to be part of a resistance that requires some kind of oppressor. They're not the resistance, they're the persecutor. But he walks over, desperately trying to be intimidating. You joined the same reason I did. Slow moving career. Not fear of the past. Faith. All faith is built on risk. No it isn't. Faith is built on belief. So that's what we have to take. You're not even going to explain it. It's based on risk. How's that supposed to help me in this scenario? I only asked if the plan was going to succeed, mate. But he's like, yeah, he's one of us, lads. I spouted something that wouldn't even classify as pseudo-philosophy, and now I've convinced him to join the cause. Suddenly, incompetence really explaining that broken door on the side of your wall, isn't it? But they get given little folders of the people they're supposed to be impersonating, which therefore knocks out the I've got to meet them and touch them in order to impersonate them. So they could just see She-Hulk on the TV and impersonate her with all the powers. So there's literally no reason for the Avengers to not be involved in this. Although admittedly, I don't care how much of a cult fanatic you are, no one's going to want to impersonate She-Hulk. Imagine having to act like her the rest of your life. That's enough to turn anyone to the other side. But we get shown the people they're turning into. I don't know, mate. Seems a little bit problematic to me. Scrolls clearly a fan of Tropic Thunder. We get this guy and this one. And yes, it does set up something for later in the episode. But to be honest, I was so bored during the scene, I didn't even remember their faces. But then we get the leader, the guy who acts every scene like he's ordering from Burger King. Now at the council meeting, I told you I had a plan for taking Earth as our own. Do you want fries with that? But he starts describing his plan, and we cut in with footage of them doing it. How they went to a royal naval yard. They're gonna strike the navy, and then the heroes of Earth will react. I was like, no they won't. You've underestimated Fury's ego, he's not even inviting them in. But he says, when the heroes of Earth come for us, we're gonna need to defend ourselves. We need to become Super Scrolls. Which I've gotta be honest, is a ridiculous superhero name. It's even worse than the rest of them, and the crap in general. Seriously, Ant-Man, because he gets really small. Spider-Man, because he got his powers from a spider. I'm sure the comic books had many strengths. The naming scheme wasn't one of them. The only way we can counter that and claim this planet as our home is to nuke it. Is to become super ourselves. And we no longer just change faces, we change powers. Utterly ridiculous. They should become the most powerful beings in the universe overnight. It's just a shame they don't inherit the IQ of the people they impersonate, isn't it, really? Super Scrolls. That's gonna be CW's next series, isn't it, really? Super Scrolls. <laughs> Super Scrolls. Heroes of Earth. What do you mean, heroes? Aren't they evil? No, because there is no good and evil. We're Disney. The humans will be at all out war with each other within the week. Why? The humans know that it's the scrolls attacking them. Why would the humans attack the humans when they know it's the scrolls attacking them? Doesn't make any sense. There's a million of you on Earth, and only one of you needs to die, and you automatically transform back into yourself. Every nation on Earth would know about you. While they're at each other's throats, we're gonna break their backs. I know we intended that to sound smart, but it's not actually a strategy. <laughs> An analogy isn't a tactic. You actually have to have things that you do. I'll invite you to join me in the extinction of the human race. I think he's just seen clips of the Barbie movie. It's enough to make anyone pray for an asteroid. <laughs> Remember, they said that this show doesn't have any bad guys. There is no good and evil in the secret invasion. It's all shades of grey. One guy wants to destroy the entire human species, but there isn't a villain. Disney is a lost cause, isn't it really? <laughs> Over to New York now. In 1998, we've just released the Blade movie, so Marvel was actually good. No wonder they were to travel back to the glory years. But we have a younger Fury. He's gone looking for his scroll misses and obviously doesn't know what she looks like. But eventually she introduces herself after she's just changed her face. She could have made herself look like anybody on Earth and she chooses, I mean, you know, at least she's modest. What does she look like? 
That depends on what day of the week it is. Everyone would think you were insane. Insane, or she just puts on a lot of makeup. She basically paints a face on her face. She can make herself look like anything. She's talented enough to paint the Sistine Chapel. Luckily, though, she just uses her talents for narcissism. But he realizes this is his contact. But she slides over a piece of information that'll put Draco's men on the back foot. And Fury, as ever, keeps it professional. This new face of yours is... Beautiful. I agree. Why would you agree? You're a scroll. Super scrolls. You're literally a wrinkly green thing from outer space. To you, all humans should look like the back end of a cow. I mean, there's a reason why Fury's complimenting you in your human form and not your scroll one. He does give lip service to how this is a terrible idea. As a rule that, you know, commander of station and operatives cannot be- in Our unit doesn't exist. Yes, it does. Just because you're off the books doesn't mean you don't exist. Just means you're not officially a unit. Fury's like, we've got these rules for very good reasons. Why don't you just break them? I think I will, actually. <laughs> I know these rules are put in place to protect the planet, but I don't mind breaking them to get my end away. We've taken Fury from Incredible Agent to Whipped three episodes. We're barely into three episodes. Of course, this is the modern day MCU, so it wouldn't be complete if they weren't lecturing you about something. And does anyone out there seriously trust our leaders? I don't know if you know who this news report is trying to imitate. I can't believe you don't trust our leaders. Load your guns. Make sure you got enough food and water. Because Prepare to defend yourself. Get some food and water, just in case our country gets invaded. Just be sensible and make some basic emergency preparations. And she says... How can you watch that poison? <laughs> I think you should all be prepared to look after yourself and become self-sufficient if necessary. Poison! How dare you not blindly follow our leaders, you cretin! And the only kind of rebuttal we get to her own blatant stupidity. Even if broken clocks right twice a day. So we happen to write that the world is about to end, but he's a broken clock and knows nothing. It's just because he's always saying that that so he happens to be correct. I mean, normally the idea that you should have food is poison. But this time, it just happens to be correct. So for the rest of the scene, she just continues to whine at him for a long time. It's actually really weird how she's like, I can't believe you left me. When the moment he comes back, she's just a complete cow to him. <laughs> yeah, love, I'm amazed he's not around here more often. She says, I understand you're Nick Fury and need to leave, but when you went away for a long time, that one hurt. He tells her he's retired and so is taking up revenge as a hobby. But he asks her if she's been in touch with Gravik while he was gone. And why are you asking me that? As I don't trust you, as I've left, you're complaining at me and everybody knows the saying. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned because she's going to attempt to bring about the apocalypse. I may have added the bit at the end there just for Hollywood morality. I just need to be sure. About what? That you're not about to cause the apocalypse. For some reason in this show, there's only two options. Who you become? I mean, let's be honest, it's a really simple question. When I was in space, did you get so pissed off that you decided to destroy the entire human species? I mean, that has some withdrawal symptoms right there. But she does give a really weird response. I wept on your pillow every night. I grieved for you. None of that is an answer to his question. In fact, it sounds like you're trying to emotionally manipulate him before you go, I'm trying to destroy the Earth. She continues whining for quite a while. Just when I thought I'd got over you, the fact that you've been snapped out out of existence, you came back and then left again and never visited me. If you're interested in who I became, I became me. The quality of script writing in this show is amazing, isn't it? Who did you become when I was gone? Me. Can you tell me about the scrolls? They're here. Who's here? Tell me something about the scrolls that fled. They're here. Who's here? I'm assuming Hollywood has more money than the Korean film industry, right? Just hire their writers. <laughs> Like, please, just hire from outside California for a bit. What other choice was there when you kept disappearing? <laughs> Can't be serious. Look, you kept disappearing. You went up to a space station and tried to defend the Earth. What other choice did I have except to bring about the apocalypse? We've all been there. It's fine, love. We understand. There really is only two choices in life. Bang, fury, or blow up the Earth. But she takes a phone call, which is definitely from somebody trying to destroy Earth. Fury's fine with it. Doesn't mind. Don't you worry about me, love. It's only seven billion people at risk. Something important? Nope. She's just told you she's going to destroy the Earth and you're trusting her word. <laughs> yeah, Fury, you just play house, it's fine. We get a zoomed in shot of, oh, he's definitely going to go through a phone. It's either going to be pictures of scrolls in compromising positions or nuclear weapons. The wonder of going through your wife's phone, it's like a lucky dip. Is she cheating or destroying the earth? Find out next time on... <laughs> Over to Daenerys now and she's getting woken up by her leader. They've got a problem with Brogan. Someone's told the police where he was headed and they've caught him. I've got to be honest, I have no idea who he is or what they're referring to. I've watched this episode twice and I have no idea who Brogan is. Are oh, they going to make me Google him? Okay, Brogan was the guy who was being
being interrogated, but apparently somebody else has got caught by the police and Brogan didn't know about it, which means one of the other few people that found out about it told them. This show is incredibly convoluted for a show where every single scene is just two people in a room talking to each other. And I don't know if it's the show or whether my brain is just refusing to learn any of this stuff. Probably a self-defense mechanism. Either way, Daenerys says Brogan could have just broken under interrogation and decided to make an educated guess about where you'd be. Is that what you'd do? I'd lie. I'm a good liar. I'm definitely not implying that I'm lying now. Oh, this is like a spy thriller for preschoolers. It's dark, gritty, and adult. Yeah, if you spend your spare time potato painting. But he like semi believes her, semi doesn't. It's very difficult to tell with him because he's got the acting talent of a brick wall. Which is weird because in the show everyone else is like at least serviceable at a minimum. So you'd expect your main villain to be incredible. All right, see you tomorrow. Early, you coming with me. The kind of riveting dialogue you get from Secret Invasion. Gripping, edge of your seat stuff. So they get on a plane, fly here. I don't know whether I'm supposed to know where here is. She gets told about how her father has asked him for a parlay. He couldn't just say a meeting. He's been watching Pirates of the Caribbean and thought, yes, that's us. Every meeting I have from now on, I'm just going to start calling them parlays. Tend everything in full pirate gear. But then he acts like a complete fool. The UN plane will be at Neptune's coordinates. It just says it out loud in the car next to somebody he doesn't trust. What can I say? It's a spy show. Everyone in it is just so subtle. Definitely couldn't be a trap while he's telling you the name of the target and the coordinates all in one go. Especially when there's no reason for him to say it over the phone because the guy on the other end of the phone knows it. Clearly for your benefit, put two and two together, get the cogs whirling, love. The cogs didn't whirl. She starts typing on her phone instead. Will he know it's me that leaked it when I'm the only person in the car when he said it? <laughs> I grew up on spy shows like Spooks and this is what I'm left with. But we're in an art gallery now for the parlay and the villain is stepping it up a gear. No longer is he just going to talk like a brick wall. No, now he's going to be obnoxious because her father appears. Gathering up all these big men for one painting. And he starts shouting. This is an art gallery. Have some decorum. Statesman of World War One. It's a statesman of World War One, folks. Why are you talking to a guy who's right next to you? Why are you screaming as if it's for the people at the back? Cold. I mean, it just sums up the whole thing pretty nice, I'd say. I love these aliens' accents. So he keeps pontificating. Oh, look at the statesmen. There's a difference between them, the leadership, and me, the soldiers. We're the ones who do all the work and the dying. Well, they're just smog eating dinner. Please, can we get to some plot? At some point during the episode, could you just, like, punch him in the face or something? For, like, uh, some kind of spike of serotonin for a split second? Hit him with the bust or something? I don't know. At this point, I don't even care. You asked me, Talos. Choice between having my story told in ink and oil paint or having it written in blood. At this point, mate, it doesn't matter what it written in, no one is going to remember this in a month. The only reason this won't get removed off Disney Plus is because it's a Marvel show. Willow was done dirty, but this deserves it. I choose blood all day long. Fine, mate, just take your opportunity. It'll definitely improve the show if he's gone. Can we get a different villain? This one's crap. So they go off to a cafe next door. I don't know if you've sensed a pattern in this show yet through three episodes. You go from two people talking in a room to two people talking in a room to two people talking to a room to a bit of an action scene to two people talking in a room. Give this writer some cafe and he'll have the time of his life. Oh, I've never experienced something like this before. Oh, I've actually got some energy for once. This is a new experience. Oh, there's a, there's a running joke that this guy likes a lot of sugar in his coffee. I really hope it's got something to do with the whole I'm going to morph my DNA stuff. Because if it's just I like sugar in my coffee, get out. You've done it so many times and it's not interesting. I like a little bit of espresso in my sugar. I like a little bit of entertainment in my TV shows, but we can't all get what we want. You know, I would be doing us both a favor. I just put you out of your misery right there. At this moment in time, I wouldn't even stop here. I feel like Kess from Star Trek Voyager, where my brain is trying to transcend the reality just in the hope it could find something competently written somewhere else. So he starts threatening him. Well, you know, you mentioned my daughter. I'm going to hurt you. He threatens him to a knife fight. And he goes, well, I can't do that. I'm a general and you're just a peasant. I may scream in an art gallery, but after all, I am civilized. Guys in the car. Want to come say hello? You want to be very, very careful now. I mean, he says that, but he's all mouth. He has every opportunity in the world to end the world's problems now. He could literally stop the apocalypse and he's like, yeah, but I'm not going to because there's three more episodes yet. I couldn't deprive everybody from this thrilling television. You should be grateful that I haven't sent that back to you in a body bag yet. Mate, at this point, I'd just be glad if you did anything at all. You wanted some dark, gritty spy drama and decided to visit a cafe. But then we get the trailer scene where he dives across the table. You mentioned my daughter's name. An 
everyone transforms into him. Now, the interesting part is if you combine all of them into one person, then it's possible you might be able to get somebody that can act. Now, it's interesting because he stops at this moment as if he's never seen scrolls before, even though he is one. Surely you knew scrolls would be about when he's the leader of them. But instead, it causes him to sit down. This guy is the bringer about of the apocalypse. If you were a good guy, you wouldn't be caring about yourself right now. But he says you're going to take our people to the edge of extinction. All these miscreants know is murder. You're the one who wants to bring about the apocalypse. This is their idea of a grey area, by the way. Oh, well, the humans just murder each other, and so I'm gonna murder all of them, and that means that I'm the good guy. What? Look how they treat each other. That's what's gonna happen. We're gonna murder them all. How does that make you the good guy? How is this a grey area? Well, I think they're gonna kill everybody, so I'm gonna do it first. If what you were saying was true, then you wouldn't need to do anything yourself because everybody would do it automatically. You could just stand by and wait, and it would happen. The, the fact that you are the impetus for the event means that you are wrong or you wouldn't be required. You don't understand the first thing about humans. I'll give you that one, mate. The writers act as if they've never met another human being in their life. But that's Hollywood in general, really. But he says if you threaten them, that's when they're at the most formidable and you don't understand me. If you carry on with this, I am going to tell them about you. I'm going to tell them that scrolls exist. And I'm like, they'd already know. There's a million of them on the planet and they keep turning into green people when they die. They're also throughout government. At some point, one of them would be in a car accident and they'd be a green person. And also, everybody knows about them anyway. The British know about them because they've been interrogating them. The Americans know about them because Fury knows about them. Just from those two alone, every country on Earth would know because they'd get told. Or they'd learn about it through their own spies of other people knowing. It's not just that your plot is badly written and boring, it doesn't even make any sense. Have you forgotten how we fight? To be honest, as we've already discovered in this episode, my brain is struggling to retain any information about this show at all. I've forgotten what happened five minutes ago. Do you think I'm gonna let you continue this war under the cover of anonymity? Oh, I hope not. He's right in front of you. Do something. And I'm gonna tell every army on Earth who it is that's attacking them. How do they not already know? Why have you not told them already? Why if the Earth is under an invasion by an alien species, is it just America that supposedly knows about it, and the British, and none of them have told anybody else? Especially when those people are trying to cause a nuclear war with someone else, just go, oh by the way, it's not us, it's aliens. Why do you think that human beings don't talk to each other? They're like, oh yeah, humans would rather suffer the apocalypse than pick up a phone and tell somebody. I mean, that's gotta be some social anxiety right there to take that consequence. He says, I'll tell them all about you and you will be put down. The villain replies, they'll do the same to you. He goes, no, no, they'll learn the difference between us. You see, you're trying to end the world, whereas I'm trying to just let it happen. Yeah, he's so good, this guy. But he says, well, if you want that, your daughter stays with me, does she? He kind of loses it at this point, stabs the guy through his hand, and then starts choking him. And I'm like, you could just solve the problem right here. You could save the world right here. Nah. My daughter's name stays out of your mouth. That's about as far as we go. Because with that, he walks out. The other guy pulls his hand through the knife and then heals it. He could have just pulled the knife out. It would have been easier, but no, no. With that, the father walks off, gets bumped into by this old guy who drops a phone and claims it's his. Obviously, it's his daughter passing the information. The problem comes, though, when this guy's following him. Happens to go in the same direction as the daughter's transformation. But as he's following her, a van gets in the way. It stops him crossing the road, which gives her time to cross the road and transform to stand by the car. Now, it's worth pointing out there are people all over the place they're just in the roads as a public space so yeah she blocked that guy from seeing a transform but she would have been spotted by everybody else in the street who at this point are going how on earth is that person transformed why is there a shapeshifter over there but nah this is supposedly london or whatever nobody cares they're too busy dodging machetes to care about an alien from outer space but the scrolls in a bar eating a rather pathetic looking english breakfast firstly it's way too small secondly there's barely any sausages on that thing i think there's one what on earth have you done to the bacon and you've only got one egg are you an animal now admittedly despite the fact that this is rather pathetic it is london so it's probably cost him like 30 quid you really gonna eat that plate of dog food? Uh, fury i agree it's a pathetic english breakfast but it could be worse it could be american food i mean imagine coming all the way across the galaxy only to eat scones milk and pig fat 30 quid for a poorly constructed breakfast not looking too bad now is it but of course the last time these two people met they fell out because fury had dementia tell me something i don't know about the scrolls that fled they're here. Who's here? Have the balls to come up in here and ask me for help? To be fair, you did tell him that you invited a million of your people
people to Earth, didn't tell anyone, and now they've spread across the planet, taking over the world and about to cause the apocalypse. Quite frankly, I think you deserved far worse, said to you. I mean, you haven't even faced any repercussions yet. But Skrull's got a lead on a rebel Skrull, high up in the US government, and he needs his help to go and ask him a few questions. Politely, of course. But this guy's only willing to join on one condition. Say the words. Help me, Dylos. Because I'm useless without you. Yep, that's what this show is degenerated into. A low-rent, interpersonal drama show with all the charm of Gotham Knights. This is supposed to be about spies with intrigue and intellectual plots, backstabbing, never quite sure who's on whose side. And instead, they start to wear English breakfasts and please beg me to help you. You know this show was the second lowest watched Marvel show on Disney+. Plus. They were too generous. Help me, Talos, because I am useless without you. As just the first step on the humiliation of fury this episode. So they head off together and they need information on a British sub. So they call the only British person that they know and is in fact in the show. She's annoyed because she found out he stuck a camera on her owl, which she's put an eye patch on him, even though she's removed the camera, so I don't know why that she needs the eye patch. Plus, if the camera was still on there, it had audio, so an eye patch isn't gonna do anything anyway. No, I think this must be some of that subtle comedy that Marvel is so renowned for. Neptune is planning to launch on the UN delegation. Well, why would you do something silly? like that. Because they're trying to bring about the apocalypse. And you can't even say it's that she can't work out why, because she knows scrolls exist as well. So you can't go, well, the nation state obviously wouldn't do it. No, but the scrolls would, because they want to bring about the apocalypse. How does everyone know that scrolls exist and just assume that they're not in these positions? This should be like the thing. You should be thinking that everybody is a scroll, not nobody. But she says, I can't help you because I've got a leak of my own. When I was interrogating somebody, there was a leak of the butcher shop location. Somebody leaked the location of the butcher shop when I was doing some of my best work. You basically just jabbed him twice. It's not as if you did anything. The, the chemical did all the work. If that's the best you can do, love, uh, you don't deserve your position. But he gets the captain of the sub's name offer and head off to his house. Meanwhile, they're having an incredibly stimulating intellectual conversation. I don't get the whole dog thing. Yeah, that's why I turn into Marvel superhero shows. Please, can we discuss why people have dogs and pick up the crap off the street? I'm not joking. That's the topic of conversation. Of course, Fury's like, well, you must understand. That's what I've been doing for you over the years, picking up yours, cleaning up your mess. Oh, that's rich. Ah, uh, the truth's a mother dog, right? Yeah, I mean, at least that's the way the conversation goes, because it very quickly transforms into the humiliation of Fury. What a surprise. Basically, the theme of the show. I actually don't think that this is meant to be a gritty adult spy drama, largely because there's no gritty adult spying going on in it. There is no espionage, no plot, no twists and turns, no backstabbing. All there is, is Fury being deconstructed and humiliated at every opportunity, and every situation is set up to humiliate Fury. And if you want evidence that it's malicious, well, I present to you this scene. When I came here in 1995, you were just a benchwoman nobody. Yeah, you were a nobody before you arrived. You were a nobody before me. And you would have remained that way. It's us that made you. You owe everything to us. I mean, yeah, you know, you're okay, you're mediocre, you're kind of smart. You're not really exceptional though, are you, Fury? You wouldn't have made it anywhere without us. You would have remained in that basement. You know, we fed you more dirt than you could have uncovered in a lifetime. I mean, every spy master has spies, but it doesn't mean that the spies are responsible for his success. This is like claiming that Jeff Bezos' success is down to the people sticking things in boxes. This isn't how hierarchies work. Every time you were promoted inside shield we did that you didn't do anything we got you your intel we did all of your work every promotion you ever received was down to us another case of a man taking credit for scroll work you are a nothing a nobody without us every terror attack you prevented we did that. You didn't even stop anything. You didn't help anybody. You didn't do anything, Fury. Ally you leveraged with dirt no one else in the world had access to. We did that. Every single thing you ever did was never down to you and your ability. It was only us. You just took responsibility for it. You took the promotions. You took the glory. We didn't have the ability to do any of it. You're just a pathetic waste of space, aren't you, Fury? You're a smart and capable guy, Fury. Nobody questions that. You're questioning that. Literally right now, that's what you're doing. 
it. You're saying everything he has is down to you, and he wouldn't have got it on his own. A smart and capable man could have done it on his own. It's not rewrite history when the guy who helped write it with you is sitting right next to you. If you're quite done with hitting him in the face with a baseball bat and crapping on the character, who is the only reason why anybody is watching this show in the first place, then please, for the love of everything that's holy in the universe, can you actually do some spying in your spy drama? You got any more abuse you want to hurl my way? That's all you're going to do. Oh, by the way, do you want to crap on me a bit more? I mean, it's buy one, get one free. If we're on a sale, everything must go. Largely, my integrity and self-respect. So they try and break into his house. The scroll transforms into their target so he can walk past the security. Until literally 10 seconds later, this guy walks out and goes, Oh, I've just left you. So he instantly blows his cover, transforms back into himself. I, d I don't know why. He even does it before the fight. You could have taken that time to attack him, but instead you're like, Oh, just transform first. I'm assuming it's because you didn't want the other guy to learn how to fight. Either way, he takes him down. Fury shoots the two original guards, now they know what's happening. And the scroll stealthily goes up the stairs, wearing a bright blue glowing earpiece for his comms on a stealth mission. How are you gonna sneak into the building dressed as the other guy with a glowing blue light out hanging out your face? And why would spies have comms devices with glowing blue lights on in the first place? Yeah, let's stealthily go in here. Oh, I'm glowing, I forgot about that. Now as he's clearing the rooms, he sees the guy's son playing video games and ignores him. But then Fury gets it's an interesting call. Come in, Taylor. Sorry, Nick. Busy kicking Bob's ass. What can I say? At least the top spies in the world engage in professional communications. But he tells him where he's located and Fury goes up to him. Nobody calls me Nick. Now that's probably the main interesting part of the show, because it shows when someone calls him Nick, he immediately realises that something's gone horribly wrong. But in the last episode, somebody else called him Nick. In the scene with War Machine, where they're ranting at each other about who's the bigger bigot. You earned all this smoke. Brother. He gets called Nick there, so presumably Fury knows there's something wrong, which might explain why he reacted to his firing how he did. So they engage in some not negotiations. The really weird part is how the father cares for the son because the father's a scroll. So firstly, how did they know that the son was a scroll? He could have actually been the real person. And secondly, if the kid isn't a scroll, then why does the scroll care about him? Because he's not actually his father. But he does care about him because he puts down the gun and gets his kid back. Thanks for saving my life, Fury. No problem, Talos. Anytime. Yeah, mate, if you think that makes up for the car scene, you are sadly mistaken. But what follows is the most stupid plot they've come up with so far. And I say so far because I am 90% I'm, I'm sure this is going to get worse over the next three. But this is at least Indiana Jones levels of stupid. In Indiana Jones, they could have escaped all of their problems by flying up. In this, they could solve all of their problems by turning the plane around. What we have is an American plane and a British sub, with the British sub about to fire on the American plane. Their plan is to stop the British sub firing on the American plane. The issue is they're linked to the American intelligence services, and if you just go, by the way, someone's gonna blow up your plane, I have a feeling they'd change course. For some reason though, nobody considers even contacting this plane. We cut over to the sub are like, this is a mistake. No, the orders have been confirmed. We've got to blow up the United Nations flight. Okay, so it's not an American flight, it's United Nations. Same thing though. You call your people, who call their people, and they just turn it around. They lose nothing. We get a really weird scene where this guy tries to feed the kid some water. This only makes sense if that kid is a scroll, but at no point does it Confirm it. Are you gonna kill my dad? I mean, hopefully something will happen at some point in the show, mate. But they're trying to convince him to just call off the strike. This guy says, I'll protect you from Gravik if that's who you're afraid of. You couldn't protect yourself coming through that door. To be fair, he makes quite a good point. I wouldn't trust you either. Especially when you're taking credit for Nick Fury. <laughs> you're a shell of the general you used to be. And at least that's an interesting comment because it mimics what people have been telling Fury. So at least when Fury isn't the only person being called old, useless crap and should probably just stop everything now. It spreads out the misery and pain across the cast. But Fury says, why don't you just shapeshift into him and call off the strike? Great idea. Why don't I think of that? He's the only one who knows the code. I mean, it can't be that difficult to get a code word out of him. You already saw he'd basically accept death for his son. You've still got his son out in the hallway. Why is this so complicated? But nobody thinks of that because, you know, why would you expect spycraft from spies? But Fury decides, I'm actually going to do something and get something done and shoots him in the knee. I'm giving you three seconds to give me that code or I'm gonna aim higher or I mean it's nice to finally see Fury do something for once and actually act like Nick Fury short-lived though it may be give me the two I said give me that gun because of course he gets stopped by somebody look Nick Fury you can't be trusted with a firearm we all know that look Nick you can't be trusted with anything dangerous or pointy actually we already know you didn't get to your position off your own merit it's all down to me so just 
Uh, I'll take over this one, thanks. Why don't you just get the plane to turn around? It's far easier to get something to turn around that you're in control of than an enemy submarine. I'm sure the plane wouldn't mind putting on 15 minutes to its journey if it meant surviving. Back on the British sub, they start getting their keys out to fire rockets. The plane's almost in range and no one has even tried to contact it. Traitors like you are the reason people have been walking in exile for 30 years. You sicken me. To be fair, they sicken me as well. I thought the first two were bad, but nothing prepared me for this episode. I don't know how you write this, film it, edit it, and think, yeah, that's a good episode of television. It's amazing I haven't needed a caffeine drip just to stay awake. But he makes a mistake when he says this. You can't even keep your daughter's loyalty. Or is she the spineless traitor feeding you information? Because now you've realised that his daughter is a traitor, he can't allow you to live. So he just shoots the guy in the chest. The only guy that could give them the code. He didn't interrogate him. He didn't question him. He didn't do anything to get answers from him. He just stood around doing nothing until the guy mentioned his daughter and then he shot him. He wasted time and then killed their only option of getting the code and Fury sat there doing nothing himself watching the other guy do nothing. Like seriously, this show's pathetic. We're supposed to think that these are incredible spies. So we find out that he was a Skrull as he turns back after he's dead. I'm assuming his son is a Skrull as well, otherwise I don't know why he cared about him. The plane is almost flying into range. We still haven't contacted it yet. He's left with one last chance. If I phone my daughter, maybe she can get the code. And I just want to show you how dramatic they think this scene is when nothing is happening. Just, just pay attention to what's happening in the scene compared to the music that you're listening to. Oh no! You're like, this is so dramatic, it's so intense, everything's happening, the world's ending, I've never been this excited about anything in my life, and then you realise, it's just the music. Yeah, whoever scored this thing has done a bang up job. Whoever wrote it, not so much. She's sitting in a chair, nothing's happening, and the music's like, oh, this is so tense. It's a very simple, easy emotional cue, in a desperate hope to cover up the fact that nothing has happened in this entire episode. So we asked her if she could get the password. Turns out though, they're tracking comms and realise, someone's phoned in from the outside. Doesn't help though, because she walks up to these guards and kills both of them before she goes to the real people that the Skrulls have impersonated and reads his mind to get the code word. She passes that along and tries to leave the building because her cover's blown at this point. She's just killed people. Back on the sub, they're getting ready to launch in probably the worst designed submarine I've seen. Look, this is where one key is and this is where the second one is. Isn't the entire point of having two keys that they're so far apart, one person can't turn both of them at the same time as a security mechanism. If you can just turn two keys with one one person, what's the point of having two keys in the first place? But he phones up, gives them the password. Abort launch. One guy goes to abort, but of course this guy is a scroll that we saw at the start of the episode. He panics, tries to grab both keys and turn them. This is why you don't have both keys next to each other, because one person can fire. But luckily, the other guy on the ship stops him. Mission successful, which also would have been successful if they just phoned the aeroplane and told it to turn around, which wouldn't have required a code and could have been stopped with one phone call to their own bosses. Top spy crash, everyone. Well done, well done. The issue is now she's got to escape the scroll compound. So Daenerys gets on a bike. Fury and the other guy are having a heart to heart. I don't know why he didn't take his deal to join them. I'm not with Gravik, because I'm with you. I already know what Twitter's gonna do with that quote. There's already been articles about how Fury and this guy could have had their true romance between them. And honestly, I'm quite surprised that Disney haven't gone that way themselves. Hey, there's three episodes. There's still time. But as Daenerys leaves, there's no one in the guard post. So she goes through the gate, only to run into a car with its lights on that blinds her, and she slips off. I mean, she's on a motorbike, and that car's static. She should have turned left, turned right, driven around it. There's nothing the car could have done. It static, pointing the wrong way. Luckily though, Daenerys is crap at motorbikes, which is understandable. She spent most of her time over the last few years on a dragon. As it is, she's got caught. She tries to spin to the boss that she's just trying to help people escape. Oh, they've got caught. I need to help them. But he doesn't believe her and says, I don't care actually that that plane's alive. It would have been valuable, but finding the mole was invaluable. But well, he says essential, but invaluable would have been better. Oh, turn around. No. You will look at me. I don't know whether she thinks that's going to stop anything, because plot twist, it doesn't. He just shoots her in the face anyway, and he doesn't care that he's done it at all. At least I'm assuming he doesn't care, because that's how all of his acting comes across. You don't really have much to go off when you watch him. But we cut over to Fury's wife. She gets a text, packs her bags, and picks up a key from a jar. I mean, I don't know about you, but I am riveted. 
Oh, the way she left that door. That was essential viewing. Worth noting, this episode is 15 minutes shorter than the other ones, and less has happened in it. She goes to a train station now, goes to a safe deposit box, and it was at this moment I'm like, I never understood why safety deposit boxes are actually held together, and they let you open them surrounded by the other safety deposit boxes. I can't be the only one who's like, you should just put stuff inside your box to open the other boxes. As long as there's no visible damage when he comes back, they'd never know it was you. But she opens a package, and it's a gun. Having a safety deposit box just to have a gun in it seems to be the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. You're telling me you couldn't have just got one from your local store? I mean, seriously. But now she gets a call. St. James Church, one hour. And that is definitely the voice of War Machine. Yeah, well, you're talking to me. Don Cheadle is a Skrull confirmed. Which is also why he called him Nick earlier. For some reason, Skrulls always call Fury Nick. I, I don't know why. Maybe they're just allergic to surnames or something. And I have to say, what on earth did I just watch? That was the biggest pile of crap so far in the series. And the only thing that really sticks with you from it is they really hate Fury and are determined to destroy him. To the point where you've now gone back in time to his history and eradicated all of it. Now, everything that Nick Fury has ever achieved in his life, it's not even his. He was described as competent, that's it, but he's nothing special. He wouldn't have become the leader of S.H.I.E.L.D. He wouldn't have actually achieved anything. It was all down to the scrolls. He just, he was just taking credit for other people's work. That's basically what this episode was, the deconstruction of Fury. Him abdicating his own responsibility, even at the end, to somebody else. Sure, he could have interrogated the guy, but the other guy, no, I'm going to do it. And you're obviously subservient to me. I've, I've done everything else for you. And so Fury sat in a corner and did nothing as a plane was about to be destroyed because he'd abdicated his responsibility to a third party. Because that's what he's done all his life. The sheer disrespect is just malicious at this point, and I don't see why this series even exists except to deconstruct and destroy Fury, as that's the main through point of every single episode. Nothing else is happening in the series. Do they put a lot of emphasis and time into those scenes where they can absolutely just crap on him from a height? Episode one, I was like, this is kind of boring. Episode two, I was like, this is actually really annoying and it kind of made me angry. And episode three, I don't even know why this exists. This is a show that never should have been made, which is astonishing for me to say, because this is the show that I wanted to be a success. I don't know what it is, but one thing you do need for spy dramas is actually intelligent writers, and, and that's not to be found here. This show feels like it was written on the back of a napkin in a chip shop, and after this episode, I can't see the viewers sticking with it. It was already the second lowest viewed according to Samba TV. I can't wait to see the ratings for episode four, but I think episode three will cause a huge drop off in views, because if I wasn't reviewing it, after this, I'd be done. I would have been done before, but even at my most generous, I couldn't stick whatever that was. Well, those are just my thoughts. What are yours? Let me know down in the comments below. Like the video if you liked the video. Subscribe for more videos like this in the future. And I will see you in the next one, because surely it can't get worse than this. But that's it for me. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.